Raphael Lumpkin was born on June 24, 1900, on a farm 50 miles away from Bialystok, Poland. He read the book Quo Vadis at age 11, which sparked his interest in the topic of genocide. He asked his mother why there is no law against killing defenseless people because they are different from you. Lumpkin attended the University of Lvov in 1920, where his major was philology, the study of the development and history of language. But he kept thinking of the millions of Armenians killed during World War I, and why there was no law to ban the practice of killing a group. This led to his decision to become a public prosecutor in Warsaw, contributing to his legal expertise. Lemkin studied about Sogomon Tulerian, who was a survivor of the Armenian Genocide. Most of his family was killed during the genocide. Tulerian decided to avenge his family's deaths and killed Talat, who was said to be the organizer of the Armenian Genocide. In response to Tulerian's prosecution, Lemkin asked, Why is the killing of a million a lesser crime than the killing of an individual? Lemkin began advocating for the banning of the killing of a particular group. He went to the International Criminal Law Conference in 1933 to present his ideas. If the international community ever hoped to prevent mass slaughter of the kind the Armenians had suffered, he insisted, the world states have to unite in campaign to ban the practice. But people at the time did not believe in what he was calling acts of barbarity and vandalism. European jurists and litigators were unmoved by Lemkin's talk of crimes that shocked the conscience. In the words of one delegate, this crime of barbarity took place too seldom to legislate. Most of the lawyers present wondered how crimes committed a generation ago in the Ottoman Empire concerned lawyers on the civilized continent. But when the war broke out in 1939, Lumpkin fled Warsaw and went to Sweden, then eventually to the United States. During the war, much of the media about the Holocaust and the killing of the Jews was suppressed or buried under other media. The U.S. Office of War Information even turned down a request to put a description of two escapees of Auschwitz. Lemkin went to Henry Wallace, the vice president of Roosevelt at the time, and presented his ideas to ban the destruction of innocent people within borders of countries. Lemkin got no reaction from him. He got indifference. So Lemkin tried again and went to President Roosevelt. The president told Lemkin to be patient. He said that at the time he could not see a law, like what Lemkin was advocating for, be able to be passed. Lumpkin was appalled that the banner of state sovereignty could shield men who tried to wipe out an entire minority. Sovereignty could be conceived as the right to kill millions of innocent people. He flashed back to a speech delivered by British Prime Minister Winston Churchill that said, As his army advanced, all districts are being exterminated. Scores of thousands, literally scores of thousands, of executions in cold blood are being perpetrated by the German police group. We are in the presence of a crime without a name. Suddenly, Lumpkin's crusade took on a specific objective, the search for a new word. If the crime has a name, governments will see how qualitatively and quantitatively different it is. Maybe then they'll band together to do what they should do. Lumpkin weighed a number of candidates, mass murder, denationalization, Germanization, Magyarization. But none of these options worked because they were either too specific or were going to be mispronounced. Then he came up with genocide. Genocide was short, it was novel, and was not likely to be mispronounced. Because of the word's lasting association with Hitler's horrors, it would also send shudders down the spines of those who heard it. Genocide is a new word combining the Greek word genos, genos meaning race or group, with the root of the Latin sidere meaning to kill. Dr. Raphael Lemkin, who is a professor of law at Yale University and specializing in teaching uh, matters about the United Nations, Dr. Lemkin is the man who created the word genocide. Dr. Lemkin, could you give us a little background on how you came to be interested in this genocide? I became interested in genocide because it happened so many times. In 1944, Lemkin introduced the word genocide in his book called Axis Rule in Occupied Europe, which described the rules, decrees, and horrors of the Axis powers in Nazi states. Lemkin proudly brandished a letter from Webster's new International Dictionary that informed him that genocide had been admitted. The very week the Carnegie Endowment published his book, many newspapers linked their coverage of the board report with Lemkin's term. With the help of Lemkin's push for the recognition of genocide, the Nuremberg trials were established to prosecute the perpetrators of the Holocaust. Although the word genocide was used in statements during the trial, it was not prosecuted. 
the court treated the violation of another state's sovereignty as the cardinal sin and prosecuted only those crimes against humanity and war crimes committed after Hitler crossed an internationally recognized border. Nazi defendants were thus tried for atrocities they committed during, but not before, World War II. By inference, if the Nazis had exterminated the entire German-Jewish population, but never invaded Poland, they would not have been liable at Nuremberg. Although the court did a fine job building a case against Hitler and his associates, Lemkin felt it would do little to deter future Hitlers. Since the Nuremberg trials had failed to convict genocide, Lemkin went straight to the UN to have his law passed. He states a machinery for the protection of national, racial, and religious groups must be established through the world body. Lemkin worked as hard as he could to get this law passed internationally as well as a convention. He sent letters to ministers of foreign affairs, presidents of republics, and to religious leaders. Lemkin states that he felt the work must be strengthened by support from the people. He convinced Panama, Cuba, and India at the onset to support his advocacy. This did not stop Lemkin, nor did it stop support of the law. Newspaper articles wrote that what is paramount is that there be no obstacles in bringing this treaty to the immediate attention of the General Assembly when it convenes in the next few weeks. And if the UN wants to hold true to its principles, the law must be passed. If the General Assembly passed the convention, nobody would be immune from punishment, not leaders, public officials, nor private citizens. The treaty would enshrine a new reality. States would no longer have the legal right to be left alone. It is a matter of great satisfaction for our delegation that the draft convention on genocide is being presented to the General Assembly today. So the adoption of the convention is as follows. Yes, 55. There are no votes against the convention. There are three absentees. So the convention is adopted by this assembly by unanimous vote. But why haven't all of these safeguards helped to prevent future genocides? As they had done in Bosnia, American officials again shunned the G word during the Rwandan genocide. They were afraid that using it would have obliged the United States to act under terms of the 1948 Genocide Convention. The Clinton administration opposed the use of the term. On April 28th, Christine Shelley, the State Department spokesperson, began what would be a two-month dance to avoid the G-word, a dance that brought to mind Secretary Christopher's concurrent semantic evasion over Bosnia. We're exposed to, to death every day and night because till now nothing has done to, be, to, to save all these people. The Bush administration assiduously avoided using the word during the Bosnian genocide. Genocide was shunned because a genocide finding would create a moral imperative. Bush told a news conference, We know there is horror in these detention camps, but in all honesty, I can't confirm to you some of the claims that there is indeed a genocidal process going on there. <laughs>